much. Um, we always knew it was going to be challenging to fit so much content into this, this relatively short session. But I think it was really important to hear those case studies, and uh, as Helen said earlier, to, to really experience the innovative um, projects and initiatives that are happening, and perhaps some of the barriers that we've identified back in the project that Jen started off with um, in the introduction are more about communicating and sharing innovations than actually um, innovating in the first place. I'm sure you've got tons of questions to ask our speakers. I just wanted to very quickly reflect on um, the project that Jen referred to back in 2019, um, focused a lot on barriers to innovation. Um, but what we haven't really talked about is what are the drivers of innovation, what's actually stimulating innovation in, in some of these projects. And I think it'd be really good to try and perhaps pick up on that, either in the time that we've got left or on the knowledge hub, so that we can capture some of that and see whether those are entirely sort of serendipitous drivers that happen and are very project specific, or whether there are sets of conditions um, and, and circumstances that we can actually start to replicate and start to support um, in the way that we design projects, whether they're developer funded or whether they're, 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 they're driven by, by other, other, other funding mechanisms or, or other drivers. Um, and the other thing that I just wanted to think about in terms of communicating about innovation is this idea of, 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 of mistakes and failure. Um, because we can't innovate without getting it wrong. Um, and uh, Rob Sutton and I, I don't know if Rob's in the audience, have tried on a, on a couple of occasions to run sessions at conference that we, we deemed, we nicknamed our festivals of failure, where we encouraged people to come and talk about the things that they tried that didn't work, and to evaluate that, reflect on that a little bit. And I don't think we've ever really managed to get that to take off, probably, because I think, apart from Rob and I, not many people are actually talking about, are constantly talking about the things that they got wrong and the things that they didn't work, and that didn't work. And I, and I think it'd be really good to, sort of, again, maybe maybe a bit on this and think a little bit more about that and why we are so nervous about talking about our mistakes. Because it's a key part of professional practice, um, reflecting on those things that didn't quite work as we expected and what we learned from them. Um, but I will sort of that point because I'm sure you um, do we have any, any questions, either specific questions for speakers or more general observations? You said again and again throughout the course of the past couple of days that both best practice and innovation are very much the best place to play in the space really, really early into the project. Midway through a project, retrofitting the project, after it's been set up, um, innovative in and of itself. And if we um, have separate to that, but how are there ways in which we can almost use those retrofitting opportunities to innovate, to test things that would otherwise not be tested, because, you know, it's already a virus scenario to begin with, so you might as well throw new ideas at something. very early design stages, um, and we know that that's not what happens a lot of the time, and, and we are, I think, very adaptable and resilient in the face of that, and dealing with those circumstances. Um. Hi, Andy Boucher from Headland. So, I think my opinion on that question is, I think that innovation can occur at any point in the project. But I'm very much of the view that where you haven't planned something at the outset, it's very, very difficult, or it's more difficult to make a success of what you've implemented by trying to introduce things to the project. Um, and you'll, I mean, you'll, you'll see sort of throughout the day that if you introduce something halfway through a project, you've missed the opportunity of that advance, if you like, in the first half of the project you're going to but on the other hand, something 
like an opportunity to provide public engagement might only present itself part way through a project when you find something quite outstanding that you think you need to change your practice. So I guess there's, there's always going to be opportunities. I think it's best if it's closely aligned to things that we do now, if you like, rather than something absolutely which I think is a big change. And if I can follow that up with a question to Jim. <laughs> Um, so, Jim, um, you, you said, you said, okay, let's step some more. An innovation is either a really good idea and adopted, or it's a good idea and you've been. I would argue that there's another part of that spectrum, which could be a fantastic idea that requires so much change that people just can't bring themselves to do it. And literally, it's that obstacle in innovation. I think it's something we need to bear in mind when we're looking at innovation. Where innovation requires a change from what we do normally, that is where we really, really struggle to adopt ideas. I think that was a terribly rhetorical question. First of all, thank you. To see why commercial companies wouldn't want to be associated with that. I mean, it's so straight that the Rob is thinking of us as a, as a good philosopher, but I'm sure he doesn't want Cotswold Archaeology to be the company that goes with failure first. It's the sponsored by, yeah, you see, that's not the, that, that would not, not be of, of great concern. Um, but the, but, uh, but yes, the idea of, of actually having a, um, let's call it a safe space. This is, this is a difficult thing to be thinking of. Yes, I mean, philosophically, and to manage you in so many situations. Again, brings it back to why this is a huge conversation for us to be having. Good morning. 
sorry, from Reconstruct Archaeology. Um, and I think the last few comments there will kind of tie together with our experiences. I mean, we've, over the last year or so, developed a very innovative, all-encompassing sort of digital recording um, system that's quite different to I think, anything else that's currently uh, being used. Quite familiar on the surface, um, but in doing that, it sort of really led me to question all of the things that we do, all of the failures, all of the things that we do wrong. And I suppose what I've learned, and I've come to learn from you, is that pretty much everything that we do in terms of field practice in the last 40 years, in terms of rural archaeology, not deeply stratified stuff, which always seems to grab the attention. Um, is probably not very good. We're doing it pretty much all wrong. So all the things I used to hold dear and have taught people for decades are wrong. So you've got a great new system, but in developing a new system, it means you can question the actual fundamentals of everything you do. Make the things a total waste of time for rural exploitations, relationships, swaps, crashes. I could go on everything basically that I used to do. Groups, subgroups, it's all a load of this is what really stifles innovation um, because we're inherently terribly conservative and we keep banging on with things that don't work year after year, decade after decade. And there are better ways of doing it. And technology really helps us to illustrate just how much of a failure some of those things are. And I think really that's probably the, the focus for so many more sorts of groups in terms of what would we really like to do. the call for papers, otherwise I'd have been up there like a shark. Yeah. So 
that there's an opportunity not only to persuade developers that they're going back to work, but also to persuade government that archaeology is a driver for innovation to society. And I can just pick on one example um, multiple sclerosis. Who knew that archaeology was solving the origins of multiple sclerosis through ancient DNA? That's the sort of stuff you can't mine anywhere else. You only get it from the stuff that you do. And the Council for Science and Technology has looked at creatives, they've written to the Prime Minister's office, they've exhorted the um, uh, investment, AHRC and UK are pouring millions into towards national collection, research infrastructure for heritage science, you name it. And archaeology should be right on that bank because by demonstrating secure a really viable future for the work that we do. I think that's a, a, a conference session for, for next year um, or for the Innovation Festival but uh, but certainly we'd like to see that as a, as a conference session um, and uh, how, how we're delivering driving innovation not being not not seeing ourselves as the recipients of it or, or necessarily delivering innovation within our community but spreading that net wider. Um, we've got two minutes. Any, any last questions for speakers? Okay. Yeah, thank you, Carla. Uh, a question from Mark and Rachel. I'm um, just uh, wondering, in terms of the published outcome uh, for your project, I know that it was evaluated by Sig for Green. For an award, and I just wondered if you had any kind of final outcome on that, and what, whether or not case study could be published for the sequel or the website to inform other developers. That's something I would certainly be very keen on, and I'm sure Mark would too. Um, yes, I completely forgot to mention that actually one of the things that happened, given that this um, project was. Uh, Attacked by Grim all the time, that we put into an innovation credit for the design and the way that we undertook the archaeology, and I'm very pleased to say that we were granted that credit. So, yes, we have full Grim accreditation for the project. The other thing I should have said, of course, is that the extra challenge in all of this was that the field work took place under uh, COVID conditions, so it just added a little bit extra to the, the challenges of undertaking. On. Um, so I'd just like to um, thank all the speakers and Jen for doing all the organising work on this session. I always get to be on the bill for these sessions and other people do all the work, which so I'm incredibly grateful for. Um, but it's been really, really um, inspiring and brilliant to hear the, the, the examples and the case studies. And please do engage with the Knowledge Hub. Um, uh, it's a really good mechanism um, and, and then it's got a huge amount of work into setting it up with Jen. Um, please do go there. What Sometimes we set these things up and it's very dependent on us putting the content in and, and we get the occasional reaction to that and the occasional comment back, but it really is intended to be a forum for discussion. So please please do use it as your as your forum um, and talk to them if you've got any questions about, about other online fora um, and ways of sharing this. But go and have a tea and then hopefully most of you will be coming back.